our next speaker is uh, Matt Newman. And are you here, Matt? I want to share your screen. You're on mute. Okay, yeah, no, I know. I have a t-shirt, by the way, that says you're muted, but uh, I shouldn't wear that today. Okay. Sorry, give me a moment. I want to introduce you. So our next speaker is Matt Newman. Um, Matt uh, studies climate prediction and predictability on time scales ranging from weekly to decadal, uh, uh, with an emphasis on the use and diagnosis of empirical models constructed from both observations and the output of climate models. Um, he's also known to um, like to have a, a cup of coffee before going to work. And uh, we have had many um, interesting conversations uh, over a coffee in the morning. And his favorite food is blackberries. <laughs> Remember that. That's pretty good. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you. I'm looking forward to your talk. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I'm actually back in my office for the first time in over a year just for this talk. Uh, so uh, got all the cobwebs out and, uh, and we're ready to go here. All right, so I, I'm gonna be uh, talking about the characterizing predictable dynamics. Uh, you'll notice a little asterisk there and that's because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use what are called empirical dynamical models rather than what people are more familiar with in terms of physical dynamical models. So in uh, Richard Seeger's immortal phrase, these are physics-free models. But first, I kind of wanted to uh, go back to this. This is always drives me a little nuts. You've seen this uh, picture a number of times already, I think, in the last week. And in particular, it's this idea of saying, well, here we are in this S2S time scale, and this is where the predictability is coming from, the MJO, land, surface data and other sources. And I can't help looking at this thinking that something is missing on that time scale, And perhaps that something is ENSO. Because even though we think of ENSO as seasonal, it turns out that we can actually expect higher S2S scale when ENSO occurs. And so here's an illustration of that point. This is a week four scale of the IFS, which is the, uh, the European uh, operational model, this is the one that was uh, operational in 2017, 20 years the hindcast for the winter, week four scale for geopotential height on the top and for surface temperature over North America on the bottom. And there's two things that are pretty clear here. Number one, most of the scale is during ENSO years. Uh, so all the other things are nice, but it's it's also good to remember. And so is the big dog, and when the big dog barks, that's when there's predictability. Uh, but there is some skill uh, at uh, non enso years, and it uh, can occur in different places, obviously than enso. Uh, and so what we're interested in more generally here is looking at a situation where the average skill is very low. I mean, these values are in general. Uh, on the average for a weekly average, they're on uh, typically 0.2 to 0.4. And what we'd like to know is, can we do better? Can we identify when the forecast will have higher scale? And that's important because for the most part, for most users, this level of scale, especially in non-ENSO years, is really probably not, not enough to really pay a lot of attention to. It's got academic interest, but maybe not so much practical interest. So what I'm interested in, what I'm going to be talking about then is predictability on climate time scales. And kind of uh, going back to what Judith talked about, uh, one way to think of predictability is it's the limit at which your forecast uh, probability distribution function uh, for day-to-day -day weather looks identical to the uh, climatological distribution. At that point, uh, you're just predicting climatology. And that's about two weeks for daily weather. This is why we're interested in taking longer averages. And so again, it's worth thinking that climate predictability is not really the same problem necessarily as weather predictability. It's sort of the statistical mechanics problem. We're really interested in predicting aggregates of daily weather. We don't expect to predict individual events. So you can already think that a lot of what's gonna be relevant for predictability on these timescales is gonna involve some averaging. Now there's two ways to do this. You could do predictability as a model construct, uh, use perfect model studies, which some people may have talked about. 
But then there's this more fundamental question about whether there are real limits even to S2S prediction, to seasonal predictability. And so there's been a body of work going back uh, particularly to Raul Madden and Leith and others trying to estimate from the observations essentially some slow predictable signal on this weekly seasonal time scale relative to fast weather noise. And the weather noise, remember, that's unpredictable. There's always going to be a lot of it. So these signal to noise ratios are going to typically be low. And that, of course, is related to the fact that we have such low scale on average. So how could we estimate the signal to noise ratio? This is just, by the way, an illustration of, of how you can derive skill. You can actually derive an expected skill given a signal to noise ratio. Basically, as the signal is getting larger relative to some spread, you would expect to have higher skill. So again, you could do this in a model. You can get the signal from the ensemble mean of the model, and you can get noise from its spread. That's pretty straightforward, but there's a question about whether this is realistic. Uh, obviously, if the model, for example, doesn't typically have enough spread, it could actually be overconfident. If it has too much spread, it could be underconfident. And in that case, its actual skills could actual skill could actually be better than its predictability. So again, we want to do this in observations. So the way we're take the approach we're, we're following is basically estimating natural variability uh, as weather noise. So you're trying to get an estimate of what the weather noise is, and then anything beyond that is signal. Uh, this goes way back to the early 60s, uh, Gilman et al., uh, a couple other papers. And as is always the case, lurking in the background is Ed Lorenz, uh, who basically uh, kind of gave him the idea, apparently. And the idea is that they were just looking at daily weather, and they found, even with daily weather, that the memory of the weather was only on the order of a few days. And you could do a pretty good job just by modeling it as something called red noise, very simple autoregressive one, AR1 uh, process, where you have some time scale of memory, and then otherwise, the variability is just being forced by white noise. So white noise means equal power on all time scales, no memory, effectively. Uh, Madden uh, uh, went and, and tried to do something similar, uh, a little more sophisticated, looking at seasonal averages, trying to see if the seasonal average variability might be higher than what you might expect just by averaging the daily red noise. Found a small difference, suggested that might be predictable. There have been more uh, sophisticated techniques since, but again, it's always important to remember that we're, you have to make some assumption about the noise. You have to figure out empirically how to separate the signal and noise. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to come up with a framework uh, that we can do this uh, empirically. Uh, and it's, it's fairly simple. We're, we're starting with the idea that we have a highly nonlinear system. And if you had a GCM, obviously, you'd have a, a resolved part of the nonlinearity. Uh, and then you'd have some nonlinear portion, which is parameterized, subgrid scale diffusion, so on and so forth. And then there's always actually a residual, uh, uh, basically, that's not even parameterized. So you're throwing away, uh, in all contexts, uh, some little bits of noise. Uh, which uh, relates to what Judith uh, talked about uh, last week. So what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to coarse grain the system. Because again, remember, what we're thinking about here is we're not trying to predict instantaneous values of weather. We're trying to predict some sort of aggregate. So we're going to be taking some averaging. And as we take some averaging, what we want to do is we want to separate the slow part that we're hoping is predictable from the fast part which may be chaotically nonlinear, but it may be unpredictable on the time scales that we're interested in. The daily weather is not predictable on two week time scales, but maybe we can get something on the three and four and five week time scale. So we do what amounts to a Taylor's expansion and you'll get a, a linear term, obviously, linearized term, but you'll also get some uh, uh, maybe noise uh, terms as well. This is the part that's kind of unpredictable. Now you get other terms, higher order, terms, and those higher order terms could be the deterministic predictable nonlinearity, but we're going to ignore them and we're going to see how far we get. We can collect terms like this. You'll get a noise term here. You'll also get a noise term that has a linear state dependence, which uh, we're going to ignore mainly because we're interested in doing this empirically. It doesn't impact anything I'm going to talk about. I may return to it at the end. The only real difference is it gives, it allows for non-Gaussian uh, statistics with linear 
uh, predictability. And so we end up with a rather simple uh, equation. Uh, essentially, we're just going to try to predict all the dynamics as a multivariate linear system. So the key thing here is this x is a state vector. It represents all the variables in the system at all grid points uh, as a function of time. And so what we want to do is we want to see how well we can do. Can we, how much of the predictability of x can we capture in this fairly simple linear way? And then given that, we all, it also gives us some idea of what the predictable nonlinearity that we've ignored uh, is contributing to the system. All right, so what does this linear operator represent? First, it's worth uh, stressing, it's not a linearization. So we're not linearizing the system. We're not assuming that the nonlinear term is small, right? We are allowing for a potentially large nonlinear term. What we're saying is that the time scale of the nonlinear term is small. And that's what allows us to coarse grain the system, that we have relatively slow linear uh, dynamical time scales, and the chaotic nonlinearities are uh, pretty fast. So on the time scale that we're trying to predict, on the weekly, monthly time scale, the nonlinearities, while they provide a tremendous amount of variability, maybe they don't provide so much predictability. So we can parameterize their effects. You can think, for example, of synoptic eddies feeding into a block, tending to maintain the block. The block is sort of your slow time scale. The synoptic eddies feeding in are fast. And so it's that, that uh, flux that the eddies are providing, which is allowing uh, the block to maintain. So again, there's that kind of time scale uh, separation. Barotropic versus baroclinic dynamics, that's also kind of a natural time scale. Uh, separation. Another way to think of this uh, that Cecile uh, Penland uh, likes to use is think of it as the dynamical version of the central limit theorem. Again, we're doing aggregates. This is the key thing here. We're averaging over a lot of individual fast events. We're looking for some slower envelope of those events. And as you average uh, events, even in a highly nonlinear system, you tend to make it more Gaussian. And when you make it more Gaussian, you make it more linear. It's also important to remember that the linear dynamics, again, this is multivariate system, that operator is asymmetric. And it's asymmetric because the system is asymmetric. If you have a shear in the system, then obviously you're gonna have different advection time scale at one location than another. So the location matters. And also different variables interact differently. So wind blowing on the ocean, for example, <clears throat> will drive changes in the sea surface height, but there's no sea surface height a variable that's in the wind uh, momentum equation. And so again, that kind of asymmetry allows for the dynamics to be asymmetry. And that's uh, gonna be important because that means that the when you look at the dynamical modes of the system, when you do an eigen analysis of L, that those eigen modes are not orthogonal and as a result, they can evolve in such a way that they can cover up each other and then uncover each other. And that can give you transient anomaly growth, even in a stable system. All right. OK, so we could, in principle, we could imagine kind of deriving this system from first principles. That would be kind of hard. But in this, in this assumption, if we're in a system where the nonlinearities are mostly fast, so that on a slower climate time scale, they're essentially unpredictable and their effects can be linearly parameterizable. These are assumptions which we want to test. Then we can empirically model the system in this linear way where X is some state vector representing a series of maps, remember, and then it's being forced by some white noise. Uh, S indicates that it could also have some spatial structure, no temporal structure though. And again, uh, we can do this because we can, in principle, this is what I just said before, sorry. We can, we can actually infer this in an inverse sense. If we have a system of this type, it implies a relationship between the lag covariability and the zero lag covariability of the data. And so we can derive this linear operator from the data, just from the covariance statistics, just like we can do this for a univariate AR1 uh, system. It's, it's exactly uh, analogous. And then the noise statistics, which I'm not gonna talk about, although they're very important, uh, but I won't talk about them today. Uh, you get that from a balanced relationship. 
Now, from a practical standpoint, this linear inverse model is computed in a low order space. It involves essentially effectively an inversion of a covariance matrix. So we do we have to truncate uh, into a low enough EOF space, a low enough dimension uh, that 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 inversion is 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 tractable, that we don't get errors, uh, very large errors. And one of the things that means is that the limb is a low order model. It's on the order of tens of degrees of freedom, maybe a hundred, as opposed to millions of degrees of freedom that you get in the model. That makes it a lot easier uh, to run in a forecast sense. So you can run forecasts with the limb in, in basically less than a minute. Now we're assuming that this is a good fit for the data. We're assuming that's a good observation we can test that. Uh, with something called the tau test. There are various ways to do this, but typically what we're looking for is that it doesn't really matter what lag we choose to derive this L. Essentially, we could look at one, one month lag covariance, or we could look at two month lag covariance or three month lag covariance for monthly data. And in principle, uh, the uh, linear operator should always be the same. And there are other tests one can do. Basically, one can look at the spectra. One can compute, for example, uh, a one month lag covariance uh, for the tropical Pacific, and then test to see that, that the resulting limb uh, gives the spectra out to decadal time scales that matches observations to the extent that it does, and typically it does, then the system is acting in a fairly linear way over you know, month to month, year to year. I'm not gonna show that here. So how do we do this? For, how do we do forecasts? Well, this is a pretty simple equation. You can just integrate this forward. Obviously, if you ignore the noise, then you have an ensemble mean forecast that can be computed very simply. Um, because this is an empirical technique, we have uh, the usual problem of having enough training data. Uh, in principle, in practice, the easiest way to do that is something called cross-validation. We typically take out 10% of the data compute the, the uh, linear operator, the limb, and then use that limb to make forecasts, make hindcasts rather, for the missing 10% and cycle through. So obviously that's different than in a GCM where you just run the initial conditions forward uh, for the model uh, for say the last 20 or 30 years. Now, again, remember that uh, that uh, the noise is, in this case, is independent of the state of the system. So that means that when we do probabilistic forecasts with the limb, all we're really looking at is, an, is a shift of the ensemble mean. We're predicting some sort of signal, and that signal is going to give a shift. And so you're going to see a change in the tail probabilities simply because of the mean shift. That actually allows you to look and see, well, so how good a how good a forecast system is this? If I compare it to a system which could potentially have changes in spread, are the uh, probabilities uh, better or worse or the same in the limb as compared to a system where I could potentially have changes in the width of the PDF as well as in its position? All right. So again, here's the complete forecast system. Now we do want to consider that spread. So we're going to have an integrated noise term. I won't get into the details of that. This is essentially the uh, forecast uh, system, including the ensemble. So each noise realization will give you a different member here. And again, you'll end up with a Gaussian distribution. Again, for any given forecast, there is this forecast error, but that forecast error, again, is only a function of the lag of the lead time, it's not a function of the state of the system. That means there is no spread scale relationship. So if to the extent that the limb predictability is useful, it suggests that there may not be a spread scale relationship on these time scales. So what is predictability in, in this context? Well, the nice thing about this is that I know what my forecast signal is. That's this term right here. And I know what my forecast noise term is. That's the statistics I have here. So I can basically determine a signal to noise ratio at every forecast time. And given that signal to noise ratio, this is just kind of a complicated, this is the actual math, but without getting in, into the details, I can use that predicted signal to noise ratio, expected signal to noise ratio to give me an expected 
forecast skill. And so I'm going to use this row infinity, we like to call it, but it's basically, in this case, the predicted anomaly correlation that one can derive other metrics from signal and noise. This predicted anomaly correlation to stratify forecast skill. So I'm looking for forecasts where I predict that my skill is going to be higher and I look at other forecasts where I predict that the skill is going to be lower. And I want to compare those predictions to what actually happened, both for uh, the limb and for operational uh, numerical GCMs. So this is a, a calculation like that for ENSO. I'm, this is a limb using uh, tropical anomalies of SST and sea surface height and wind. Comparing it to the NMME, I'm looking at an ensemble mean of eight uh, operational models. And we're looking at that for 82 to 2010. So here on the left, I'm showing the month six forecast uh, along the equator. I'm showing the, the skill, it's a skill score. It's sort of an error measure, but basically uh, a score of one would be perfect. And the, uh, the blue line here is the limb and the red is the ensemble mean of the eight models. The little lines here are the individual models. The green is the predicted uh, spatial variation. And so the first thing you can see is that in general, the predicted spatial variation is being mimicked by the limb. The limb is basically picking up that same structure. Now we can also look in time and see how the evolved pattern correlation is. And what we find again is that there's a very high correlation between the limb variation and skill in blue from year to year and this ensemble mean, this NMME uh, actual uh, forecast skill. In fact, the correlation at six month lead is 0.8. And again, both of these, uh, the variations are basically being predicted uh, by the limb. So the limb is able to predict spatial and temporal variations in its own skill. And that actually seems to also match the spatial and temporal variations that we see in GCMs. All right, so that was a seasonal. Now we'll switch to a sub-seasonal time scale. So this limb is a little different. We're constructing this out of a lot of atmospheric variables here. In particular, there's a, a vertical, uh, vertically integrated uh, diabetic heating is a component of the limb state vector. And we're going to compare that to two operational models, the EC uh, model IFS, which was operational in 2017. Uh, and the CFS, which is actually operational now. And again, it's key to remember both of these are bias corrected. So they're actually, they're already somewhat empirical. If you look at the skill of these models uh, without bias correcting, uh, the error is going to be uh, quite a bit bigger. All right, so here's the uh, weeks three, four skill and the weeks five, six skill for mean sea level pressure uh, for the 99 to 2010 period, because that's all we have for the CFS. And again, you can see that in, in all three models, there's a similar pattern of skill, uh, very clear maxima in the North Pacific, a secondary maxima or another maxima out in the Atlantic. And these, ma these maxima very, uh, match very well. Regions of lower skill are also lower in both the models and the limb. The limb typically has uh, poorer skill when it's bad. So there's a tendency for the limb when its skill is low, its skill is really low. Uh, but when its skill is high, it's typically comparable with uh, the couple models. And you can kind of, you can sort of see that here. But again, the limb is basically capturing the spatial uh, distribution of regions of high and low skill. Now we can also, again, look at that temporally. And this is kind of, in a way, it's the central figure of this talk. The limb is identifying what we would call forecast of opportunity. In other words, when we look in the limb and find the 10% of the time when the limb is predicting that its skill is going to be highest. So this is at the time of forecast, the limb is saying, this is going to be one of my higher forecasts. We can then uh, look at what the limb actual skill is in those scenarios. And that's these orange, the dark orange bars here. And we can compare that to the limb skill when it's predicting low skill. And you can see it's definitely getting that stratification, even gets it the first week. But you can see that uh, stratification as you go on through. Obviously, there's a lot of sampling issues on 12 years of hindcast. 
What's nice is that the limb is also capturing the IFS and to a lesser extent, the CFS variation in skill. So again, the limb is picking out the higher IFS skill versus the lower IFS skill. And again, here's our higher IFS skill and lower IFS skill. So the limb is not predicting just its own uh, high skill cases, it's predicting the model high skill cases. And this is a better metric as it turns out you can look in the paper if you're curious. Again, to looking at a spread skill relationship. If you go into the IFS ensemble and try to compute uh, high and low skill cases based on the spread skill relationship, you won't get nearly this sort of uh, separation. So again, it's just basically suggesting that to the extent that the limb is capturing the variability, sorry, capturing the predictability of the real system, that most of the predictability is just coming about because of this mean shift in the signal, uh, not so much because of changes in spread. That's in the Pacific. Uh, this is the NAO. The black line is the uh, IFS scale. Now, actually, we've captured about the top 15% uh, here. And so that black line is representing the IFS scale for the NAO in the 15% of the cases when the limb is predicting higher skill. And the orange is the limb's own skill in those circumstances. And that skill is considerably higher than in all the remaining 85% when the limb is predicting lower skill. Here's the IFS and here's the limb. If you remember, like I said, when the limb is bad, it's awful. Part of this has to do with this low order uh, truncation of the limb because we're not representing the entire system, but we're representing the part that's largely predictable, which is all we really care about on these time scales. So where is this coming from? How does the limb do this? It's magic. No, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty simple. I, if, you, if you go back to what I was talking about earlier, uh, this linear dynamics, like I said, is non-normal. What that means is that initial conditions can, depending on how they're oriented, extract uh, energy essentially uh, or uh, from the system, from the basic state of the system, but they can only do that for uh, finite time periods. They're not exponentially unstable. These initial conditions, they can initially be in a position where they can extract energy, but they evolve. And as they evolve, they change their shape and they change their pattern and they evolve in such a way that they are no longer able to grow and then they begin to decay. So these are all transient events, but these transient events can last for weeks and that allows a lot of predictability. So for example, uh, without, again, getting into the, the details of how you compute this, if this is the initial 250 millibar uh, stream function pattern, and this is the initial heating pattern uh, in the limb, 14 days later, this is the pattern that will evolve. This is essentially kind of a combination of an ENSO and MJO heating. Basically, the MJO heating starts kind of out of phase with the ENSO, and it ends up being in phase with ENSO. And as that ev evolution occurs, there's a large amplification of the stream function anomaly. But if you were to look at day, I don't know, 40 or 50, I forget exactly when, this will have decayed so that it's now less than it was initially. But that transient growth is important because when that transient growth occurs, that means that we're getting a larger signal. And so our signal to noise ratio can be particularly large if initial conditions have a particularly large projection on this pattern or potentially this pattern or this pattern. And that's what's shown here. These little stoplight plots are showing the various cases when there was a large projection on one and or two and or three. So all three, just one and two, one and three and so on. And again, these are stratified by three things. First, the black bar shows the limb predicted skill in those cases. So you can see this is basically working. Uh, as, your pre as the initial condi condition is projected more on these initial patterns, the initial uh, optimal structure, you get more uh, signal growth. And so the expected skill is higher. The red shows the actual skill. So again, we're predicting the variation in skill. And this is kind of an old model, this MRF 98. It's uh, somewhat worse than the CFS is today. But even in that case, uh, we were still predicting uh, the uh, uh, the uh, stratification of the actual uh, model as well. Hey, Matt, 
could you wrap up in the next three minutes or yeah, so? Yeah, I am. I've got a clock and thanks, thanks so much. I'm almost on schedule. Uh, so this is just kind of an illustration of what this non-normal amplification looks like. Essentially, again, like I said, there are these uh, the eigenmodes of the system are non-orthogonal. They're not like EOFs. You can't partition the variability in the eigenmodes. One can't really talk about so much variability in this eigenmode and so much variability in this eigenmode. And if I add it up, that's the total. It doesn't work that way. They cover each other up and then they reveal. So for example, for ENSO, a lot of ENSO can be understood as this so-called four-year eigenmode, which is uh, similar to, uh, to uh, theoretical eigenmodes that have been determined, and this two-year fast SST mode, which initially cover each other up. So the SST anomaly is pretty small, but here's this uh, heat content anomaly. Nine months later, this mode has evolved, but somewhat slowly. This one has evolved quickly, it's changed sign and decayed, and you end up with the SST uh, amplification. Uh, similarly, in the atmospheres for the PNA, for example, uh, if this is the initial 200 millibar uh, stream function anomaly, that seems to be a consequence of a, a uh, structure that looks like this, which I'll just call an internal. Uh, it's unrelated to SST, basically. And then here is a component which is related to SST, basically related to ENSO. So these two are covering each other up. You have a slow initial, uh, a small initial uh, stream function anomaly. The SST and, and heating in the tropical Pacific are large, though, and they're driving uh, this growth so that after 15 days, there's a large amplification uh, of the PNA. You'll notice this is entirely flip sign while this has stayed almost the same. So this is evolving more slowly. This is evolving quickly and goes from destructive interference to constructive interference, giving us transient growth and predictability. Okay, I'm off by a minute, not too bad. All right, so to conclude then, the predictable S2S variations, what we see is that they are largely driven by these linear but non-normal dynamics. And we can, we can make that claim because we've tested this. So a low order linear model, in fact, reproduces the, uh, to a very good approximation, the GCM ensemble mean scale, and largely predicts both the limb and operational model spatial and case-to-case -case variations in the skill, which means that predictability, although there can be certain preferred states, those preferred states are being arrived through linear dynamics. They're largely being driven because certain initial conditions, if they're uh, forced basically randomly, will evolve into particular states, those particular uh, growing structures that give rise to more uh, predictable signals, which also means because we're doing this in the limb that the initialization only needs to be correct in a fairly small subspace. So it's, it's interesting that we want to try to get a perfect initial condition, but a lot of what we're getting in the initial condition on these longer time scales just generates noise and it does not necessarily yield uh, predictability. So again, while these empirical models are physics free, they do constrain physical dynamical models. So we do want to be thinking about how do you get, how do you go from these highly nonlinear physical systems and arrive into a system where most of the predictability is largely linear. And I just want to have one, this is sort of a postscript, but, but this also kind of says something important about S2S forecast in general. Because it's again useful to remember that on average S2S forecasts have low scale. We're fighting against the weather noise, which is not predictable. And even in, in the best locations, the average scale is generally below what is considered to be useful. And that suggests the importance of this predictability problem. Because while there are some users who could use small shifts of probability, so, you know, an anomaly correlation of 0.2 gives you a bit of a shift. Maybe that's still useful. There are a lot of users, I would say most users, that most decisions are binary. And that's particularly true if you're not particularly rich. You don't usually get to come back from a bad forecast if you're, if you're not very rich. If you're a ski area and you have a low snow year, you can survive it. So these issues are important. And so uh, to me, it's really suggests the importance then not just from a scientific perspective, but from a societal perspective of trying to identify these relatively few forecasts of opportunity 
and being able to confidently identify them ahead of time so that we can go to people who need forecasts and say, this is a forecast that you can trust. Okay, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt.